Our main sources of information for Viking Age heathendom are the four poems of cosmological and mystical content known as the Seeress's Prophecy, the Sayings of the High One, Vothrunner Sayings and Grimner Sayings, which form part of the collection called the Poetic Edda, and the use made of these as illustrative material by Snorra Sturluson in the Prose Edda, a manual for the understanding of poetry which he wrote in Iceland in about 1220. As a lover of literature and a man with a strong sense of the importance of maintaining a respectful relationship to his cultural tradition, Snorra had become concerned that, after 200 years of active suppression of heathen culture by the Christian Church, the survival of the large body of Old Norse poetry known as skaldic verse was threatened. The understanding of it depended to such a high degree on a knowledge of the myths and legends of the Old Norse gods and heroes that, unless something were done about it, they would shortly become incomprehensible to future generations of Icelanders. The chief problem was the use made by skaldic poets of elaborate figures known as kennings, periphrases which used details from the mythological stories of the adventures of the Norse gods and heroes to create names for familiar places, objects and people from other contexts that pushed them three or four metaphorical steps away from the original referent. The greater the distance, the greater the skill of the poet. The game for the listener was to untangle this dense thicket in order to reach the meaning of the poem. Though wildly anachronistic, the adjective Baroque suitably conveys the degree of their complexity. It was always recognized that Snorra must have worked from a specific collection of poems, and in 1643 a vellum manuscript containing what turned out to be this collection came into the hands of an Icelandic bishop and scholar named Brynjolfur Sveinsson. Dating from about 1270, it was itself a copy of an original dating to the early years of the same century. A few years later the bishop presented the collection to the king of Denmark, apparently as a way of restoring his own reputation and that of an unmarried daughter who had severely embarrassed them both by getting pregnant by a young priest. Since that time the manuscript has been known as the Codex Regis. Many of Snorra's references in the prose Edda were to details of Old Norse cosmology and myths that had remained obscure for later scholars, and the emergence of the poetic Edda proved the key to unlocking many of them. The cosmological poems are difficult to date. Unlike skaldic poetry, which is by named poets, their creators were unknown. The unhurried devotion of Vothrunner's sayings might suggest that it was composed well before its author perceived any threat to heathendom from Christianity, perhaps early in the 10th century, while the urgent intensity of the Seeress's prophecy suggests it may have been composed as an act of liturgical defiance much later on in the same century, when the threat was more clearly perceived. The prose Edda opens with a section called Gilfagetting, or the beguiling of Gilva, that describes how a legendary Swedish king Gilva visited three heathen gods in order to question them about the origins of the world. Snorri uses the replies King Gilva receives to lay out the creation myth and cosmological structure of northern heathendom. Gilva learns that everything began in an empty chaos that contained a world of heat and light called Muspelheim, and an opposing dim, dark and cold world called Nivelheim. The two worlds were separated by a chasm, Ginungagap. In the extreme physical forces that operated across Ginungagap a giant named Dimmer came into being. He was nourished by milk from the udders of a primordial cow, Ajumla. Adhumla next licked the salty stones around her into the shape of another giant, Buri. By an unspecified process Buri fathered a son, Burr, who wed a giantess, Besla. The couple produced three sons, one of whom was Odin. Odin and his brothers created the physical world by killing Immer and, in an act of prodigious violence, tearing the body apart and flinging the pieces in all directions. The giant's blood became the sea, his flesh the land, his bones the mountains and cliffs, his skull the vault of the heavens. Later, as Odin and his brothers were walking by the sea, two logs washed up on the sands, and from these the gods created the first human beings by breathing life and consciousness into them. They named the first man Ask and the first woman Embla. Ask means ash, the meaning of Embla remains obscure. Snorra's further history of earliest things proceeds in a detailed and poetic vein, and to a modern mind unfamiliar with his world and his mindset it rapidly becomes confusing. Our confusion is compounded by the fact that in the Inglinga saga with which he opens Heimskringla he provides a completely different, humoristic account of the origins of Odin and the Aesir, as Odin's family of gods was known, in which Odin features as the chieftain priest of a tribe living in the area around the Black Sea in the days of the Roman Empire. This tribe migrated northwards through Russia and finally settled near Uppsala, on the coast of south-central Sweden, where Odin rewarded his followers in the traditional way by dealing out land to them. Rather than attempt to resolve these paradoxes, our aim here will be simply to try to abstract from Gilfaginning and the cosmological poems a general outline of the worldview that underpinned Viking Age heathendom. 
The cosmological world was conceived of as a flat circle divided into three distinct regions, each with its own characteristic set of inhabitants, and sharing a common center. The innermost world was Asgard, where the Aesir lived, each in his or her own home. Odin lived in Valhalla, Thor in Trudheim, Freya in Folkvang. As the god of war and warriors, poetry and hang men, Odin's work was to inspire poets, wage war and give fighting men courage in battle. Thor was responsible for natural phenomena such as wind, rain, thunder and lightning. These two were the most important male gods. In general terms Odin was the aristocratic god, worshipped by the dedicated warrior and the poet, while Thor was the god of the farmer and common man, especially popular in Iceland, Norway, and Denmark. The Eddic poem The Lay of Harbard summarizes the distinction thus, Odin claims the earls who fall on the field, Thor only thralls. Freya was skilled in sorcery and was the embodiment of female sexual power. Her brother Frey was the god of male potency, good weather, good harvests and fertile beasts. The image of him that stood in the great heathen temple in Uppsala sported a large, erect phallus, and the seven centimeters high bronze figurine found at Rowling in Sudermanland, priapic as he sits cross-legged and naked save for a pointed cap, one hand holding his braided beard in a gesture of self-control, is almost certainly a depiction of him. Another god that looms large in the myths and the Eddic poems was Loki, a son of giants adopted into the family of the Aesir. He was also Odin's troubled half-brother whose amoral and chaotic fickleness and lack of discipline introduced a dangerous unpredictability into many of the Aesir's enterprises. Beyond this inner region was Midgard, domain of the humans. The word meant home or farm in the middle and conveyed clearly the human sense of being located midway between the gods in Asgard and Utgard, or the outer place, the outer rim of the Discworld a region inhabited by giants and other elemental beings associated with untamed chaos. Between Midgard and Utgard lay a sea, home to an enormous serpent which encircled the world and kept it bound together by biting on its own tail. The vertical axis of the flat, round world was an ash tree named Yggdrasil, connected to the sky at its crown, and at its roots penetrating to a subterranean realm that included a well, known as Urd's Well, where the gods held their assembly meetings and where three females, known as Norns, spun out the destinies of humans and gods alike. The role of Yggdrasil in this cosmology was to assure the inhabitants of Midgard that there was a center to the world, and that all things were connected, appearances to the contrary, despite the ceaseless struggle between a will to order, represented by the gods of Asgard, and the entropic lure of chaos, represented by the giants and creatures of Utgard. The tree symbolized the cycle of life, drawing water from the well at its roots and returning it to the world as nourishment in the form of dew. Though Utgard was a threatening and frightening place to be, even for the gods, it was understood that in the chaos within its borders lay the raw materials necessary for the learning of new skills and the creation of valuable treasures that the Aesir could hand on to the humans of Midgard. The story of how Odin forced the secrets of the art of writing runes from the reluctant terrain of this mental region is a dramatic illustration of the view that learning, knowledge and progress had to be fought for and suffered for. In a famous interlude in the long wisdom poem The Sayings of the High One, Odin describes how he hung from the branches of Yggdrasil, I know that I hung on a windy tree nine long nights, wounded with a spear, dedicated to Odin, myself to myself, on that tree of which no man knows from where its roots run. Despite his status as the god of hanged men, it may be that on this occasion he is to be imagined as dangling upside down by the foot, as the hanged man of the medieval tarot is depicted. This simplifies the logistics of the theft that follows, no bread did they give me nor a drink from a horn, downwards I peered, I took up the runes, screaming I took them, then I fell back from there. Proudly Odin relates the advances that his suffering has paid for, then I began to quicken and be wise, and to grow and to prosper, one word found another word for me, one deed found another deed for me. These skills were duly passed on to the inhabitants of Midgard. The story emphasizes the thirst for knowledge that was one of the most striking of Odin's characteristics, and the lengths he would go to in order to get it. In another story Odin requested a drink from a well of wisdom maintained by a mysterious giant named Mimir. When Mimir suggested an eye as the price of his ascent Odin did not hesitate to pay. Odin's curiosity about the world, and his willingness to take enormous risks to satisfy it, are among the characteristics that distinguish him most sharply from the omniscient and omnipotent god of the Christian conception. Another is that the Aesir knew they were mortal. Odin's search for knowledge was very often a driven curiosity aimed at finding out more about how their deaths would occur. In some cases these tales of the gods on their forays into Utgard to outwit the giants and wrest secrets and treasures from them also give an insight into the lost astronomy of the Viking Age. Odin's sacrifice of an eye is likely the remnant of a story once told to explain why the sky only has one eye, 
in the form of the sun. The Sibyl in this verse from the Seeress's prophecy seems to be referring to the rising of the morning sun, I sat outside alone, the old one came, the lord of the Aesir, and looked into my face, why have you come here? What would you ask me? I know, Odin, how you lost your eye, it lies in the water of Mimir's well. Every morning Mimir drinks mead from Warfather's tribute. Seek you wisdom still? More directly explanatory is a story of the constellation known to the Vikings as Thiazzi's eyes. As a result of a piece of intemperate behavior by Loki, the god's apples of eternal youth fell into the hands of a giant named Thiazzi, whom they had to kill in order to recover them. When Thiazzi's daughter Skadi turned up at Asgard looking for revenge for the killing, Odin offered her compensation in the form of celestial immortality for her father, throwing his eyes into the night sky where they became stars to which he gave the name Thiazzi's eyes. These two stars are probably to be identified with Castor and Pollux in the constellation Gemini of our own astronomy. The tale of Thor's duel with the giant Rungnir is another myth with astronomical content. Following his success in the duel, Thor helped out a dwarf named Orvandil by carrying him across the primordial river Elivagar in a basket on his back. When Orvandil complained of frostbite in one of his toes Thor broke it off and threw it into the sky, where it became the star known as Orvandil's toe, corresponding in our astronomy to Alcor and Ursa Major. Thor told the story to Orvandil's wife Groa as she worked to remove a splinter of broken whetstone lodged in Thor's head after the duel. Groa became so excited at his news that she abandoned the job and never returned to it, leaving poor Thor with a chronic headache. This whetstone splinter in his head was said to be the nail that held Yggdrasil fixed to the sky. Its modern astronomical correspondent is probably our Polaris, the North Star in Ursa Minor, then is now the star around which the whole of the northern night sky seems to revolve. Viking Age Scandinavians must have had many more such explanatory tales, but the early scribes of the Christian era who had occasion to mention the stars and constellations in their writings preferred to use the Latin names, with the result that the native names disappeared, all but those few which survived down into Snorra's time, securely embedded in the Eddic poetry. Probably as a result of his preeminence as the god of poets, Odin had over 150 names, but the most significant of them was simply Allfather. Most of the gods were his children by various mothers. Some of them were Aesir, like himself. Others, like Thor's mother Jord, were giantesses from Utgard. That the gods of Asgard were willing to engage in such fraught unions with their enemies underscores Midgard's perception that social and technological advances could only be achieved by risk-taking. Among Frey's significant earthly progeny was his son by the giantess Gert, who became the first king of the Ingling dynasty that ruled over the Swedes and, in later, historical time, over the Norwegians of the Vestfold region in the south of the country, Semming, founding father of the long line of powerful chieftains who ruled over the Laid district in the region of Trondheim in present-day Norway, was likewise the son of a union between a god and a giant, as was Skjold, the legendary first king of the Danes. This genealogical link back to divinity was important because it legitimized the claims to power of the Scandinavian kings who ruled in later, historical times. This world of Asgard, Midgard, and Utgard, with Yggdrasil at its center, can be seen as a macrocosmic image of the world of a typical, Viking Age homestead. At the center stood the main farmhouse building and outhouses, ringed around by a belt of cultivated land and pasture. Beyond this lay the rimmed horizon of uncultivated wilderness. Close by the main house stood a tree, known in Sweden as a Vartredet and in Norway as a tree or house tree. Each family cultivated a mystical association with its house tree that served as a symbol of continuity through the generations. The circle in the physical form of a ring had particular significance in Viking heathen culture. As a symbol of loyalty and honesty it appears in an entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for 876, noting a settlement between the Christian King Alfred of Wessex and three Viking chieftains. The chronicle tells us that the chieftains swore him oaths on the sacred ring that they would leave his kingdom at once, and that this was a thing which they would not do before for any other nation. A verse in the sayings of the High One expresses in negative fashion the binding gravity of such an oath, Odin didn't honor his oath on the ring what good is any pledge he gives. Suttung died of a poisoned drink, and Gunlod grieves. The reference here is to the story of how Odin obtained the meat of poetry from the giant Suttung, having seduced his daughter Gunlod, to whom Suttung had entrusted the mead. This, like the secret of the runes, is another example of a treasure stolen by an inhabitant of Asgard from the hazardous mental region of Utgard for the benefit of the humans of Midgard. Odin broke his word to Gunlod because the consuming need for poetry justified any means to gain possession of it. This ruthlessness in pursuit of his own ends made Odin feared and admired among his followers and, as we shall see, 
Viking warriors abroad would very often take their cue from him in their dealings with the Christian kings of England and Francia. The ring seems also to have been a symbol of eternal recurrence, illustrated by one of Odin's magical treasures, the ring Draupnir, made for him by the dwarves of Utgard, that dripped eight new rings every ninth night. The ring also played an important role in the sanctification of heathen gatherings. According to the Book of the Settlements, a ring was to lie on the altar of every Icelandic chieftain and he was obliged to wear it on his arm at every assembly meeting over which he presided as chieftain priest. The same obligation is also referred to in a description of a chieftain priest's temple contained in the Erbyge Saga. This is a late source, probably composed about the middle of the 13th century, and though the usual reservations about reliability have to be made it is evidently the work of an author with a great interest in the early history of his own country. He mentions a table in the center of the temple with a ring lying on it. Sacrifice, varying in intensity from fruit to the offering of a life, was a central means of communication between followers and gods, and beside the ring stood a bowl in which the blood of a sacrificed animal would be collected. Next to it lay a twig that may have been dipped into the bowl and shaken over the gathering as a way of binding it together, much as Moses is said to have done in the Old Testament. It may also have been used to create a random pattern of blood spots in which the chieftain priest might read the oracular response to an important question. The sites of two major festivals are known, one at Leda in Zealand, in Denmark, and the other at Uppsala in Sweden. Both were in Eatic events, announcing a mystical attachment to the number 9. At the festivals at Leda 99 humans and as many horses, dogs and roosters were sacrificed. Though he did not see the building himself, Adam of Bremen reported a description of the temple at Uppsala in his Hesta Hammerbergensis as a sumptuous palace, richly decorated in gold, where people gathered to make sacrificial offerings before a trio of images, with Thor at the center, flanked on either side by Odin and Frey. Each day for nine days the males of nine species, including humans, were sacrificed by hanging from trees in a small copse not far from the temple. One of the textile remains from the Osberg burial appears to show such a scene, with numerous bodies dangling from the branches of a large tree. From Soxo's passing reference to the clatter of actors on the stage it seems the rituals also involve the performance of some kind of cult drama. Songs were chanted at the Uppsala festivals which were reported to Adam of Bremen by his informant but which the cleric found so obscene he declined to record them. Houselong, by the late 9th century Norwegian Chadolf of Fen, is a rare example of a skaldic poem that incorporates lines of spoken dialogue which may have been part of such a cult drama. Of the actual formalities of worship, however, we know little. The only prayer of direct address to the gods is the brief invocation in the Lay of Sigurdrifa, Hail to the Aesir. Hail to the goddesses. Hail to the mighty, fecund earth. Eloquence and native wit may you give us and healing hands while we live. Archaeological evidence that human sacrifice was practiced as exist, but is not extensive. Much depends on the interpretation of the finds. In the 1990s excavations were carried out by a team under Lars Jørgensen of the National Museum of Denmark on what was originally thought to be the rubbish dump of a chieftain's farm on a site at Lake Tiso, in western Zealand. The team unearthed an increasingly confusing mixture of buried silver, gold, and animal and human bones, which eventually, along with the illogical location of the dump on a hilltop, persuaded them to reinterpret the site as a place of sacrifice. At Lilmer in Barlingbo, on Gotland, Close to the modern town of Roma and near to where the island's main assembly formerly met, an excavated pit that contained the mingled remains of humans, horses and sheep has been tentatively identified as a place of human sacrifice. There is more potential evidence in scenes depicted on the Hamar's picture stone from Larbro on Gotland, dated to 700-800. A man carrying a shield seems to be tied by his neck to the branch of a tree which has been tethered down. When the tree is released he will be jerked from his feet. The main focus of the scene however, is the small figure, perhaps a dwarf or child in the center of the panel, who lies face downward upon a platform of some kind. Above the figure hangs a vulcnut, three triangles that mark the victim as dedicated to Odin, bound in the same impossible perspectual framework that so fascinated the Dutch graphic artist M. C. Escher. A separate category of human sacrifice involved the killing of slaves to serve their dead masters in the afterlife. Ibn Fadlan's account of the funeral on the Volga to which we referred earlier included a description in pathetic detail of the fate of such a slave, cajoled into volunteering to join her owner in his funeral ship with the promise of a few days of special treatment and a great deal of alcohol. After her ritual rape by the chieftain's companions she was handed over to an old woman known as the Angel of Death to be strangled and stabbed before being carried onto the funeral ship beside him, along with his shoes, his weapons and the other items he would need in his next life. 
Most double graves from the Viking Age which show an apparent inequality in the status of the dead are interpreted as being those of master or mistress and slave. Of two male skeletons found in a single grave at Stengad, in Longland in Denmark, one was buried with a spear in the other, bound and decapitated, has been identified as his slave. The Viking Age grave at Balatir, on the Isle of Man, also contains two bodies, one a male buried with his sword, shield and three spearheads, the other a female with the top of her head sliced off, the mark of a ritual death. Sacrifice was so central to the practice of heathendom that the law codes of the Christian era culture that eventually displaced it in the Scandinavian lands found it necessary expressly to forbid the practice, nor may we sacrifice, said the Norwegian Gulathing law, not to heathen gods nor to mounds nor piles of stones. The Gotland Gotaligan was similarly trenchant, all sacrificing is strictly forbidden as are all practices formerly connected with heathendom. Equally dogmatic was the upland law of the eastern Swedes, no one shall sacrifice to false gods, nor worship groves nor stones. These greater and smaller feasts were important social and religious institutions that bound communities together under their chieftain priests in symbolic acts of feasting, eating and worshipping. They were also occasions on which the important matter of the law was dealt with. The old Norse gods were not ethical beings. Ethics were the province of man in the law. The word sin does not appear in any Viking Age literary source until as late as about 1030, when the poet Torarin Lovtunge in his Glillenskvita described the Norwegian Saint King Olav Haraldsson as having died a sinless death. Viking Age ethics were based on the opposition of shame and honor. Openness was the keynote of the oldest surviving codes, and though these were written down in post-heathen times there is no reason to doubt that they convey the spirit of the ages that preceded them. Whether it be a business deal or a divorce, the requirement of the law for a large number of witnesses was always present, underscoring the role of shame and discouraging anyone inclined to go back on an agreement entered into so publicly. The distinction drawn between crimes committed openly and in secret marks an even clearer example of the use of shame to maintain social order.